My name's Zach, and I'm back. I wasn't ready for it. The Lord didn't deposit a word in my head that morning that revival was going to break out. But within a couple hours, I knew that something very significant was happening. Gam is a routine chapel service at Asbury University has turned into something much bigger. Whatever it is, revival, awakening, outpouring, happening in a social media age, what effect do you think that had? Oh, I think it was huge. Like, I don't think there's a lot of people that are thriving because of social media. Asbury outpouring, Asbury revival at the time was the fastest happening to a billion that just reveals the hunger of people have for hope and good news people want to pigeonhole this and they want to give it a label what would you call it looking back a year later yeah it's been interesting that's been a question that lots of people have asked hi i'm glenn from speak life we like to see all things through the lens of jesus it's my great privilege to have zach meerkrebs on the line from kentucky in the us of a hello zach hey how are you brother I'm doing really well. Uh, how would you like to be introduced to the people? Many people might know you as uh, the guy who preached at the very outset of what's being known as the Asbury outpouring. Um, but how would you like people to understand who Zach Meerkrebs is? That's a kind question. I would say, uh, I think it sounds cheesy, but these days I'm just really grateful uh, to be a dad to three little girls and married to my wife and i just get to testify about jesus uh, in unique ways over the last year but um i've been wrestling in this this concept today even as i'm preparing for traveling and speaking of just john fifteen fifteen, that we're no longer slaves but friends of jesus so without being cheesy those are the things on my heart today that you could identify me <laughs> <laughs> that's very good i like but that. i did preach I did preach. I did preach a sermon at Asbury. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I like that. That that makes you a friend of a friend. Here's Zach. He's a friend of a friend. Um, <laughs> yes. <laughs> there you go. You can probably start everything with that. Yeah, yeah. Well, I usually introduce myself as uh, I'm. I'm Glenn. I'm Emma's husband. I'm Ruby and JJ's dad. And and people often afterwards sort of say, "Oh, yeah, neat trick." to kind of do that subversive way of introducing mm-hmm. yourself. And I'm like, no, but genuinely, that's the way I think of myself. Like, we, we belong to one another, yes. don't we? We belong to Jesus. We belong to our families. It's like that, yeah. Okay, take me back to the 7th of February, 2023. Uh, how did you think the year 2023 was going to go for you? Take, take me back to what your calendar looked like, what your plans were for the year. Yeah, it was really interesting. Um, kind of to answer that question, I could go back to like October, November of the year before. Um, and really I was like convicted more recently of just kind of being in this season of careerism. I had been working in a denomination and just like what I thought was like a dream job, which was way over my head was kind of was presented to me. And I thought like I had made it, you know what I mean? And I felt like, man, this meant that I, that I'm worth something and, and these things. And my wife has an unbelievable call in her life. Uh, the state we live in Kentucky at the time was the worst state in the United States when it came to child uh, mistreatment, abuse, uh, neglect. And my wife, uh, all of her work has been towards, uh, children trauma. And, uh, they had started this clinic and this dream job I thought I was going to have would require us to move and for her to walk away from her calling. And we were praying through that and just didn't feel God's peace on it. So we said no to this job, staying in Kentucky. And I was just honestly pretty angry. Now, as much as that, my wife is just like, well, what am I going to do? Like, like there's nowhere I could work. There's, you know, what, what's going to happen. And I felt like God had kind of spurred me on that something was going to happen in central Kentucky and to fight to stay here. But that even seemed kind of like fluff, you know, and maybe, and then, um, was really praying for God to come through and provide a way for me to be myself and express my giftings. And in, kind of this, not even a side hustle, but a volunteer role uh, as a soccer coach or football coach uh, for the university's team. 
kept me at Asbury. And when they had found out that I had been a pastor for 10 or so years, they had asked me to speak in chapel. And February 7th, actually, I was in a different state doing an event and thought I would be home with enough time to sermon prep for the 8th. And God really moved in a really miraculous way at this event on the 7th, which was powerful, but also made me get home at like 3 or 4 in the morning with no time to sermon prep. So um, I woke up February 8th still asking the Lord, what is, what are you going to do? How are you going to provide for myself and my calling? And um, went to a local coffee shop and studied Romans 12 in preparation for chapel. I had thought about it and had some ideas down, but put it together and showed up to chapel that day. And something that's really beautiful part of the story is the choir that was singing leading worship that day had had a very supernatural experience the day before uh, through this experience called a witness in circle, which has been happening around the States, specifically around racial reconciliation between uh, black and white leaders. And that had happened on campus on the seventh. And those events are when a black man would read the deeds of a slave owner out loud. And then the white leader would uh, apologize. And then there would be a prayer. And then the next deed would be read. And this happened the day before on Asbury's campus. And the choir that was going to sing in chapel on the 8th had been a part of that the day before. So they were kind of lit up, felt like the Lord was preparing a space for him to move in a unique way. And I, you know, had, had faith and but kind of also was like, okay, yeah, we'll see. Yeah. And then, um, and then chapel happens. And I think so often, um, like, like when, when I'm underprepared, I, I bring too much to the table, which is like for, for those who don't yeah. speak very often, um, it might, it might seem counterintuitive, but like if I'm, if I'm well prepared, I'll say less. If I'm, if I'm badly prepared, yeah. um, I, I will bring like, like 28 slides on a, on a memory stick. And, and, exactly. and I, I believe that's, that's what you, you, you brought, you brought more slides than you could possibly use. Yes, exactly. We had like 20 minutes and I did not get through my slides and I remember clicking through my slides and saying, you know, if if you would like to stick around and talk about this, uh, you know, I have coffee in a couple hours, but I would be willing to stay. And and it was really it was really about experiencing God's love so that we could authentically love others. That was really what the sermon was about, it was Romans twelve and first John four. And God was generous in, you know, in those moments, but uh, yeah, definitely wasn't as prepared as I needed to be. Got in my seat after preaching and texted my wife that I had laid a stinker and that I would be home soon. And uh, I did not get home soon. And uh, within a couple hours, I was texting her to bring the girls because God was doing something. Wow. Wow. And we've we've had a look at your your sermon on the on this channel um before and there was something beautiful about you you bring Romans 12 and like first of all your your unprepossessing style you you know you you open with you know I'm Zach and I'm back and uh a number of times in the sermon you say you know I want you to forget me but I want you to remember the Lord and um I, I, I love the, there was a I, there was kind of a moment where you I, I don't think you planned to pray in the middle of your sermon as as you know you're asking the Lord to apply a, a specific point and and like you go to this prayer and then like you find a screw on the on the f- on the stage floor and you sort of pick it up and then you're sort of mid prayer and you continue the prayer. There's something very laconic, something very laid back, um, something you know it wasn't polished delivery. It wasn't, um, yeah. It, it it wasn't that kind of professionalized deal. It was it was Zach being Zach, and bringing law and gospel. I think in this this beautiful way, you say, you know, there's 30 commands here and 13 verses. How are you feeling? We cannot love like this. 
unless the Lord loves us. Um, it seems to me that there was kind of a law and gospel thing going on. Is are those those sorts of terms that you you think through in terms of you know the law is God's demands and then the the gospel is as Christ's offer? Was that something you you were trying to do in the sermon? Yeah, I think that's something that's especially on my heart when I'm in a context like Asbury, like a, it's a small Christian school, and you know it makes me think of. A lot of times when I preach in contexts like that, whether it's a church or youth conference or a university like that, I think about Galatians and this life of the spirit, and, you know, under the, under the cross and life by the law and the flesh. And I think a lot of people struggle with that. And I think this generation not only needs to be reminded of the goodness of the gospel, but I think some people would say I might preach that style because I'm ill prepared and I'm not professional. I think I can be professional. I just don't want, I want them to know that I'm a normal person. That's just opened up scriptures like they could tomorrow morning. Yeah. It's not a performance. Yeah, no, no, not at all. And it's been hard since in the last year to, to not, to still guard that, you know what I mean? That I'm still just Zach and, wherever I'm speaking, you know, our friend, Jay John, this story, like months later, I go to this place and I'm like, I want to blow their hair back. And I've prepared this sermon and halfway through the sermon in the back of my head, I'm like, it, this is not working. <laughs> like, and I think there's a lot of times that people are frustrated because they've tried so hard. They've polished so much and that's not what people are looking for. Uh, they just want to experience Jesus. So you preach the sermon, and you, you make an offer, like if people want to know and experience the love of God in this way that you are speaking about, you know, hang back. And about 19 people do, is that right? Yep. Um, and, and things grow. So, to, like, pick up, pick up the story. How, do, how, does, it, how does it snowball from, from 19 people hanging back at the end of chapel? Yeah. I can even send you some videos. Um but those early, early minutes or even first hour or so, there's a gentleman named George Dumain who was a volunteer in the gospel choir that day, but uh, continued to lead worship. Some of the students stayed back to continue to lead worship. And I would say they really did. Like, I felt like I was able to invite and then they were able to usher in, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. And some of those early moments you just see – George leading us in worship or some of these students leading us in worship. And, and I remember just sitting in the front row watching and I've been at services that go long and people want to stick around, but I haven't, it was something different. It was, you know how I put it is like, I'm, I'm in rooms even since we've had chapel services that have lasted a day or two and they feel different because it feels like um it feels like the will of the people involved does that make sense like mm -hmm. we want to continue to worship so we're going to stay in worship or we see god moving let's not shut it down this was it didn't feel like the effort of people to stay it just felt like god lingered in a unique way and and students had permission to stay. Does that make sense? I, I, well, I, I want it to make more sense. I love that phrase. God, God lingered. <laughs> we did, we didn't linger. God lingered. That, yeah, I, w I would love to have. It's hard to yeah. explain because I think we have to give permission, and I think what we did was gave permission for students to stay. Um, with with the inv invitation. But it did not feel like 19 students gritting their teeth. <laughs> right. You know what I mean? Or a worship leader who's like, I'm going to fight for this moment. You know what I mean? Or um, it just was an encounter with God. And over the next hour or two, we saw lots more students coming back. I remember just seeing in the front row and hearing people come through the back doors uh, where I was sitting, there was an entry kind of right in front of me. And I remember clear as day, there's a couple guys in, on the soccer team. 
that don't know Jesus and uh, I've been praying for and investing in and they poked their heads in and I got to wave them in just to sit by me and just experience it. And all three of them gave their lives to the Lord during those 16 days. Wow. And, um, but it kind of snowballed around 4.30 that day. So about five hours after chapel was ended, around 4.30, the president came in and, and some of the administrators kind of rallied and were like, something's happening. And Kevin Brown emailed the school and said, you know, classes are still on, but just to let you know something unique is happening in chapel. And right around then was the first time I got on camp, I got back on stage. And we facilitated some time of sharing testimonies. And I read Isaiah 55. It's not a whole lot of sparkles, you know. And and then around 7 o'clock that day, a good friend and mentor, his name's Dr. David Thomas, I had texted him that something was happening and invited him to drive down to Wilmore. He lived, it was about 30 minutes away. And I remember in the basement of Hughes, the president, one of the vice, two of the vice presidents, myself and David were there. And it wasn't like some prayer meeting. Like my daughter was running around with Chick-fil-A sauce all over her. One of the vice president's daughters was playing tag with Eden, my daughter. But David, I, I'll never forget, David said, I think something is happening here. He was like the first person to narrate. Now, this is special. Hmm you should think about keeping chapel open through the night. And what were people calling it at that, at that point? Because in in one sense, people, people want to pigeonhole this and they want to give it a label. Um, What, what were people saying about it on day one and what would you call it looking back a year later? Yeah, it's been interesting. That's been a question that lots of people have asked. Um, You know, there's stories of students that day running class to class yelling that revival had broken out. And, um, lots of people would like to use that word. That word carries a lot of weight around the world, but specifically in Wilmore and Asbury, because there was a similar experience in the seventies, actually a similar experience in the nineties, similar experience in the seventies, then a similar experience uh, in, I think 1905, but we really tried to just honor those moments and honor what God was doing by just saying, you know, we're not going to name this. Um, we leaned on John nine when the blind beggar uh, had been healed and the Pharisees were trying to kind of be exacting and, and, uh, and try to get it real focused on, okay, is he the Christ? Is the person who healed you, is he the Christ? They even went to talk to his parents and ends up the blind beggar just saying, I don't know. All I know is I was blind and now I see. And that's kind of how we feel. And even a year later, I still feel the most confident and comfortable just saying, all I know is God fell in power and presence and peace. and His kindness led lots of people to, Salvation led lots of people to healing. Is it revival? I, I, I don't know. I think history will call it that if it's supposed to. I do see God doing some really unique things in the church. And maybe Asbury gave them hope or gave them vision. You know, um, maybe we can describe what we experienced um, and that might provoke some people to do the same. Yeah, I see a lot of. I mean, it's it's whatever it is, a revival, awakening, outpouring happening in a social media age. Um, what effect do you think that had on on the experience? Oh, I think it was huge. You know, I think social media is just full of lots of temptation to compare and compete and just is kind of an icky place. Like, I don't think there's a lot of people that are thriving because of social media in their lives, you know? And, uh, you know, Asbury outpouring or Asbury revival, 
at the time was the fastest hashtag to a billion during those 16 days. Hmm. And I think that just sees that just reveals the hunger of people have for hope and good news and uh, authentic encounter with Jesus, you know, but I think that was huge. I think, you know, there was people all over that saw it on TikTok and drove or saw it on Instagram and flew in or things like that. So I know for me, I had to get off social media for most of those days because it was just uh, such a temptation and in some ways toxic and for me. Yeah. Yeah. I'll imagine that you like the temptation to see like, what are people saying about me? Um, yeah. because yeah, people aren't always the kindest, but then I, I guess there's, there's temptations both ways, aren't there? You know, some people can be very cruel, but, but also yeah. large numbers can, can puff us up as well. Like what, what, what's that like being at the, at the center of that kind of trend? Oh yeah. Well, to be really honest, I remember maybe the second or third night I got home at like three in the morning and I was exhausted and I'm like trying to turn my head off to go to bed and I get on social media and I'm before I know it, the sun's rising and I've just totally, I've just totally drank the Kool-Aid and that's, that's when I gave my phone to my wife for the rest of the time. And, uh, I think it's just that we're creatures, we're humans. I want to be kind to myself and be compassionate. I've never been in this situation before, but uh, it was hard. You know, we talked a lot about what was God telling us about celebrity culture? What was he telling us about nameless and faceless, just ordinary people who are encountering God? And even since carrying some of that, some of the messages around nameless and faceless and radical humility and things like that, then how do you, how do you then still steward it by telling the story and be on podcasts and travel and speak, you know, and having to trust that the Lord in the Lord, that that's not contradictory. Um, and that's where I've had to rest. Yeah. Right. But it's hard. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's, I mean, it's, it's hard at the best of times, but, but when you are a trending hashtag, I imagine it's, uh, uh, it's orders of magnitude more, more difficult. Um, some of the stories I've heard coming out of Asbury have been like the area of repentance um, that so many students kind of had was, was around social media and around their phones and, and perhaps porn as well, but, but kind of like handing over yeah. their phones and, and that kind of thing. Can you, can you talk to us about, I mean, people will want to say, okay, if it's a proper outpouring, awakening, revival, whatever it is, we want to see salvations, we want to see repentance, we want to see healings, we want to see maybe like racial reconciliation or something. And and like I, I read all sorts of people saying, if this is a true move of God, we will see X, Y, and Z. Um, but talk talk to us about like repentance, because I've heard such heartening stories yeah. about how the kindness of God led people to repentance. The reality is, is, you know, I, I was not like a revival geek. I, I did not read books on it. I did not. Um, but even since just hearing about other, you know, kind of supernatural move, movements of God and and seeing God manifest in different ways, maybe in other times being in, in a lot of power and signs and, and um, these epic moments, it really was, there were so many people that came into Asbury or at Hughes Auditorium and were underwhelmed hmm. with their first, like first, exp their first impression was underwhelmed, but they were quickly overwhelmed by the humility and kindness of Jesus. And they found themselves just desiring to, to give things up. So we shouldn't be surprised because scripturally we are told his kindness leads us to repentance. But I think it, it, it convicts us. It confronts us that we might think, you know, preaching leads us to repentance or, uh, whatever, but his kindness does. And we saw that and it, it's, it was unbelievable to see, the hunger of students, uh, in those first days, no joke, it, the carpet at the altar was saturated in tears. Like it, it felt like someone had just spilled water all over the altar. 
but it was those tears. And we had cell phones turned in, you know, e-cigarettes turned in, apparent other paraphernalia turned in because his kindness, his, the affections were being turned because what we were seeing had captivated their hearts. And, you know, even their hunger for consecration and repentance around their relationship with the stage was really beautiful. Um, knowing that the platform, especially as it got bigger and bigger, could be quite a temptation. And um, these guys are, you know, 18 year olds and Grammy award winning artists are like sitting in second row, you know? And uh, have you heard about the consecration room in that experience? I have, but tell, yeah, tell, tell us the story. Yeah. Yeah. So we have a green room, uh, which most chapels and churches or events have green rooms. Um, but, uh, the students early on, there's, it was kind of twofold. One, we were running out of worship leaders because we had been leading worship for 24 seven and we just had run out. So they knew we needed to find more worship leaders, but we didn't know them. So we couldn't, we couldn't vouch for their character, you know? So then they're like, well, we need to have some kind of practice that would prepare someone's heart. Whether we know if they're, you know, competency wise, it didn't really matter at that point. That wasn't the target. It was holiness, which I think we could spend a lot of time there. You know, it was consecration instead of competency. But at the same time, there was this green room concept of like, well, we don't, they started getting catering to the specific place just for the worship artists. And the students started getting upset about that because they felt convicted. And they said, well, we don't want catering anymore. And we actually don't want a green room anymore. And they found this place to be called the consecration room. And that would be a place of confession, prophetic ministry, worship themselves, worship just with themselves. And a time of silence before the Lord, they took all the clocks off the wall. They moved the furniture. There was not catering so that everyone on stage had to spend at least 30 minutes in the consecration room before they got on stage. And there would be times that they would be in there for two to three hours because God was just doing the work and they just weren't ready yet. And, um, there would be times that artists or, you know, worship leaders would come out of the consecration room, start leading worship, and a student would come up to them and say, I actually think you're supposed to go back in the consecration room. Like, literally, as they're leading, whisper in their ears, and they would get off stage to go back to the consecration room. And it was just kind of this permission because it was a priority. And uh, it was the same in our preaching. We had to, we had to do the same. Sounds like there was a lot of wise leadership going on at a, at a time of, of kind of, in one sense, great blessing, but also high stress um, just because of the, the pressures that are yeah. on people and I guess sleep deprivation and all sorts of things. But but the, the wisdom in the leadership is, is a theme that I hear again and again. Quickly, the leadership team expanded from like me and the president to about seven of us and we would meet in the storage closet of Hughes Auditorium. <laughs> And that did sophisticate to kind of concentric circles. But I think something that I've actually been meditating a lot on is I think a dear friend of wisdom is sobriety. I think sobriety gives us, brings us to wisdom. And I think in moments like what we experience, you can be so drunk by the experience, by the, the opportunity ahead of you, the amount of people that are here, you could just be so disoriented and tempted to, get lost, which is like getting drunk on it. Right. But if we pick sobriety, that this is really, what we're stewarding is really important. These are the temptations and dangers. I think it led us to a place of wisdom. I think sobriety leads, leads us to a place of wisdom. And when you're stewarding a moment with the Lord and you, you're, you're, you're experiencing encounter, it's hard not to be sober minded. Mm -hmm. So we tried really hard to be sober minded and make decisions 
that were marked by wisdom and humility and a real submission to Lord. We met every three hours and there was many days that we were like, I wonder if we'll meet in three hours. I wonder if it'll be done. And it, and it was, but that was something we had to hold our hearts appropriately towards, you know, um, and those meetings were really holy and really, really hard. Hmm. Why were they hard? You have seven humans hmm. that are doing their best, you know. You have sleepy humans. You have, you now, you know, pretty early on we had Asbury leadership, my leadership, and then this other organization came and joined um, in partnership and brought strength called New Room. And so you have those three personalities of organizations along with seven personalities of human beings. Plus we would disagree, you know, we would disagree on what's the priority. What, what do we do? Uh, different things like that. Mm -hmm. uh, but it was hard. And I think the Holy spirit moving is already, is always going to just create this kind of crucible moment for our flesh. You know what I mean? And that's the beauty is in leadership. It's as much about who we're becoming than what we're doing. You know, that's fascinating to hear because I, I think if I, if I imagine an outpouring of the Holy spirit, I might think it's just a warm bubble bath, right? Or it's just, I, I can just go on autopilot mm. now because spirit take over. Um, but you're saying it's a crucible. That sounds very different. You know, it really was like a warm bubble bath at times and also spiritual warfare and the most intense game of like football, just that you had to be locked in and like focused. And yeah, it was, it was, it was hard, but I think it's the joy of what I said is he was not going to have me lead at Asbury without forming me into what he wanted. Mm. Um, you know, I think that is the, the unique thing about spiritual leadership is he's as concerned about who Glenn and Zach are becoming as what we're doing for an organization or as we're preaching. Right. And actually I think that's more captivating to those who are watching and who we're leading. Right. Right. So give us, give us some, some kind of, highlights of what the 16 days were like but what we really want to get to is like what do you think the lord was up to in you and we want to get to like has asbury changed have these other places that 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 have had kind of outpourings of their own have they changed what what has changed because of those 16 days but just give it just gives a really brief sense of um like how many people came and what was, what was the sort of the, the scale of things? Because one of the criticisms that you see online is it was just a flash in the pan. And, and so what, you know, some, some students had a lovely fortnight. Um, well, that's, that's nice for them. But what, what, what do you see as the ongoing fruit? But, but first of all, just, yeah, give us, give us some highlights of, of what was happening in, in, in that time. Well, I think first, I love that we serve a God that would be totally okay uh, with it being a lovely 16 days mm -hmm. for 60,000 people. You know, if we, we read in scripture that he would leave the 99 for the one. So if you do the math, then I think he would actually be totally delighted in that. So I'm not trying to be provocative. I like that. But, That's good. Uh, I think that's actually quite a captivating thing about God that he would, he would do such a thing for one person to come to Christ. Um, so I think when we want revival really bad, we lose sight of that. But when I want Jesus, I don't lose sight of that. So, but what we did see was we had conservatively around between 50 and 60,000 people there over the 16 days uh, that last weekend was most likely the most crowded and I believe we had about 23,000 people on campus that day 
you have to remember this campus is built for about 1500 mm -hmm. students mm -hmm. and this unit and this town had has two stoplights a subway sandwich shop a uh, mom and pop kind of coffee deli spot and another coffee shop um has a seminary on one side of the main street and a university on the other. So 60,000 at one point, the line to get inside was between not eight or 10 hours. We had, I believe seven or eight different locations that were simulcasting worship because at one point we really did want to prioritize Gen Z, Gen Z 25 and younger. So, by the end of our time there, Hughes was prioritized for Gen Z. And um, what was really beautiful was everyone outside of that age range, we didn't really experience a whole lot of um, heartbreak or frustration. Um, but during those days, how it would kind of look is it was 24 seven with kind of organized programming starting in the morning then kind of a lunch break, then afternoon, then a dinner break, and then evening. And that would include more in the morning and afternoon would include kind of elements of scripture reading, compassion, uh, sorry, confession, um, testimony. In the afternoon, David Thomas would preach on revival and kind of help narrate what we're seeing and what we've seen through the, through history. And, and then in the evening, we would usually do a, a, a uh, a talk on consecration and then an evangelistic message, which my friend Jeannie would normally do the consecration message and I would do the evangelistic message. And then I tried to pull in some students to help me with the evangelistic messages. So they were preaching alongside me. So there's multiple times a student would preach the gospel and then I would kind of catch the moment, lead prayer and things like that. So that was really beautiful. Um, over time, we moved away from 24 seven, uh, but we still stayed in that kind of program rhythm. Mm -hmm. And uh, and then, yeah, around the, around, as we went into that final week, it was pretty clear that something needed to change for the students, the staff, the city, the city is a generous word, the town. Um, the police had asked, the government had asked, Staff were amazing, but were very sober minded of, hey, we're here and we're here to serve. But this is costly. And I think Kevin Brown and his staff, the president of the university and his staff, made a really courageous decision um, to kind of catalyze it. And what was unbelievable was we had already pl had an event planned two years ahead of time that I was really unaware of called the Collegiate Day of Prayer. And that was on the February 23rd. This year, it's on the 29th on a different campus um, in Texas. But, um, and it was interesting was that event had two huge um, speakers that were supposed to fly in and speak, Rick Warren and Francis Chan, mm -hmm. and had a worship band. And, and but because of the moment, they, they willingly stepped out and did not speak. We had students speak. We had students lead. And what was really interesting was God had, it kind of felt like God was filling this bucket with his presence and, and Hughes was the bucket, Asbury was the bucket. And then this event, because of their ability to, to broadcast it, it felt like that event just poured out that bucket. And we had close to 5 million people see that service mm -hmm. because they had been prepared to broadcast it. So mixed with their preparation, the broadcast and the buzz around what was happening, that combined was picked up by, you know, stations around the world. And there's a prediction of just under 5 million people who saw that, that event. So, yeah. Amazing. Amazing. And you're an evangelist at heart, Zach. Um, so, seeing people come to the Lord must have been a, a real thrill for you. Uh, tell us, tell us about some of those stories. Yeah. The two, two of my favorite stories, the first time we gave the gospel, uh, an opportunity to receive the gospel. Um, there was a gentleman who had just got out of prison the week before and had heard about what had happened at Asbury and found his way. 
And it was one of those mess. It was the first time he gave a gospel presentation. It was like day two or three. And, you know, you give the opportunity for people to respond and no one responds. <laughs> and then this gentleman in the back row stands up and he runs to the stage. And I had done this before, but not. It, it had it became kind of practice at Asbury, but I'd done this before of just, you know, talking about Luke 15, that heaven rejoices over one sinner who repents more than 99 who don't need it. So I said, okay, this guy's going to pray. We're going to lead this guy in prayer. And when we say, amen, I want you to go nuts. Like you're at a sporting event or, and we say, amen. And this gentleman gives his life to Christ. And the, the it exploded it was so loud and i have a video of it and i can't watch the video without crying wow because it you just imagine that in multitudes in heaven when one person gives their life to christ <laughs> <laughs> there, there it is. Wow. Um, it kind of grabbed everyone by the ears and said, no, this is what it's about. Like, like a revival is reviving the church for his mission, his purpose. You know, like it's not re just reviving our prayer meetings. It's reviving the mission of God in our churches that might require prayer meetings and might require lingering and it might require a new way to preach and it might require giving gen z the microphone once in a while but what the purpose of the church is his mission and and sometimes we get sleepy and dead in mission and it was just this opportunity another time when i shared the gospel it was it was unbelievable i remember it was later in in the 16 days and, you know, I did the classic repeat after me. And I, I remember I said, Jesus. And I heard so many people say Jesus that I corrected them and said, no, no, no. I like literally get out of the moment. I'm like, no, 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 guys, whoever wants to give their lives to Christ are praying with me. So, okay, if you want to give your life to Christ, pray with me. I say, Jesus. And it gets louder. Wow. And uh, they said multiple of thousands of people came to Christ that night. And in all the locations and in the, in the lawn where we had two big screens, there was just hundreds and thousands of people who gave their lives to Christ. And I could hear them from the outside yelling, Jesus, repeating after me. And I thought they got it wrong. <laughs> So those are really, really powerful. And then, you know, there was the moments of a junior in college preach the gospel the last night of, you know, the 23rd, which ultimately 4.8 million people saw a junior preach the gospel. Like, what does that mean for the next generation? Yeah. Like, what does that mean for Zeke Atha, the young man who preached? Or Christian Alexander who preached the message on consecration? You know? Those are moments that I'll never forget. So since then, it's just been really exciting to then teach people how to lead people to Christ, like lead people to a decision and in preaching and in relationship. And that's been exciting. I'm, I'm doing that this week, going to a conference and presenting multiple times on it. And in April, going to another event. And, and it really is this marriage of encounter and evangelism both at the same time. Mm -hmm. And when encounter works hand in hand with evangelism, the actual evangelism is like cutting butter. You know, it's once they see Jesus face to face, it's, you don't really need apologetics. You just, they're convinced, you know, <laughs> no offense to apologetics, but it, you don't have to be a good preacher. You just, you just narrate what they're experiencing. 
and it was really powerful so that would change everything about evangelism and apologetics if we if we actually reminded ourselves it's about meeting god isn't it it's, it's yes and then just be really good narrators just be really good narrators of hey this is what you're experiencing that's called conviction and you know there's there's a there's a way to deal with that conviction that leads to life everlasting or just being miserable <laughs> you know you're just narrating what's happening <laughs> you know i was like i have so much to ask you but um I want to uh, respect your time. Can I can I just ask you one more question about um, Gen Z, Gen Z? Um, it's it's often um, popular to kind of just wail on Gen Z, Gen Z, um, and here's here's the the iPhone generation um, that are self absorbed. But but I think I think Asbury gives a kind of a counter narrative to that. Tell, tell me why you're hopeful for Gen Z. I'm hopeful because Gen Z is not going to pretend. They're not going to, they're not going to fake it. Um, I think in later or earlier generations, there, it was a level of politeness to, um, you know, to, to at least nod your head and smile. And Gen Z just is like with their attendance, with their opinions, with their posts, with their words, they've made it very clear that they're not, they're not going to fake it. And that actually is really ripe ground for a move of God. And I think if leaders like you and me are sensitive enough to meet them in that, you know, if you're a superstar, then they have to be a superstar in their heads. You know what I mean? If, if the only way to be intimate with Jesus is to be sparkly, um, then they have to be sparkly and they're very aware that they can't be. And we're actually very aware we can't be, but we don't like saying that, <laughs> you know, but when we're just authentic and raw and not faking it, but really this beautiful picture of like, follow me as I follow Christ. I think there's just a lot of hope because it, it just costs more to follow Jesus now. It, it, it means more. So if they're saying it, they want it and they want, they, they really want it. Mm. And, you know, when it comes to Gen Z and, and even outpouring a revival, something I've been preaching a lot about as I travel is this concept of like the 10 and two spies in number 13. They all saw the same thing. And it was really good. It was milk, milk and honey. They all saw the same things that were going to be hard fortified cities and giants, but two spies came home with hope because Jesus, because God said we were going to get the land. 10 people came home with frustration and disappointment because it was just going to be too hard. So I just feel kind of like one of the two spies when it comes to Gen Z and just like, yeah, the walls are big. Like what they have built around them, they have fortified themselves, but we can break down those walls through our authenticity and through our friendship and uh, and vulnerability. And yeah, there's giants and really the giant that we're going to have to kill is ourselves, our ego, like our expectations. That's always the hardest giant to kill, right? Mm -hmm. Is our ego. But if we tear down those fortified walls between Gen Z and us and we kill the giant of ego, like the fertile, the ground is fertile and the fruit is good and it's milk and honey. Now it will be hard and it will take new things, but it's not impossible. So that's my heart is to be one of the two spies. Right. Be like, Caleb, and give me I this think, mountain. Yeah. yeah. Give me this generation. Yeah. Caleb and Joshua. Yeah. 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 Love it. Love it, Zach. I could talk to you all day. Um, this is rich stuff. Um, for those who might want to keep up with you online, like, or, or have you kind of cast your, your cell phone into the sea, never, never to be seen again, oh my uh, are there ways that people can keep up with you? Yeah, would, that's one way they can pray for me, is in that. Hmm. But 
I do now have a website, which I feel like even awkward about that, but um, it's just been helpful to keep connected. So that's just zachmurecreeps.com. And that we'll have um, coming out with a book um, that's ultimately about a lot of these things we're talking about. It's not just about Asbury. It's about preparing humble, broken vessels to experience God. And uh, we do that out of love for Jesus and not love for revival. So the book is coming out. Um, I have an ebook on evangelism coming out to help just resource the church. Um, they can also follow me on Instagram. And that's just at zachmirkrebs.com or at zachmirkrebs, yep. And uh, we just love your prayers. We love your prayers for Asbury's campus, for our travels, um, for the team who led uh, Asbury together. We, we meet quarterly and are continually asking the Lord, what might we do? We're actually all going to be together this week to lean into that. So, yeah, we would love to stay connected and, we just really appreciate for your, your friendliness and your kindness and uh, your questions about something that's so dear to me. Mm. Well, it's, it's been so refreshing for the global church to look in and, and to see the ways in which you not only experienced the presence of God, but, but kind of stewarded that moment with humility and with wisdom. And you taught us so much. I've, I've met a, a couple of students from, from Asbury who just, they've got their heads screwed on so well and they they have been so clear that what we need to seek is not revival but Jesus. Um, and if yeah. lots of people seek Jesus together, you might want to label that revival. But what we're seeking is not not some kind of Amen. idol, and we can make idols of the best of things. But the the thing to seek is is Christ Himself. And and I think you guys have modeled that so well. And and what you've said here just resonates so well. Man, thank you so much. Bless you, bless you, Zach. And I'll let you get back to your daughter. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, bro. Thank you.